The trouble with your generation, Dad, you can only think along certain lines. Charlie Stavros, Harry says, trying to get a handle on it. The kid seems in a pretty open mood. Rabbit dares go on. You remember he saw your mother for a while. I remember. But everybody else around here seems to have forgotten. You all seem so cozy now. Times change. You don't think we should be? Cozy? Nelson sneers, sinking lower into the depths of the old sofa. I don't give that much of a damn. It's not my life. It was, Harry says. You were right there. I felt sorry for you, Nelson, but I couldn't think what else to do. That poor girl Jill. Dad. Skeeter's dead, you know. Killed in a Philadelphia shootout. Somebody sent me a clipping. Mom wrote me that. I'm not surprised he was crazy. Yeah, and then not. You know he said he'd be dead in ten years? He really did have a certain... Dad, let's cool this conversation. Okay, suits me, sure. Rain. So sweet, so solid. In the garden, the smallest scabs of earth, beneath the lettuce and lopsided bean leaves, perforated by Japanese beetles, are darkening, soaking, the leaves above them glistening, dripping, in the widespread vegetable sharing of this secret of the rain. Rabbit returns his eyes to his magazine from studying Nelson's stubborn, clouded face. The best type of four-slice toaster, he reads, is the one that has separate controls for each pair of toast slots. Stavros and Melanie, can you believe? Charlie had kept saying he had liked her style. As if an apology for having cut his father off when the rain was making him reminiscent, Nelson breaks the silence. What's Charlie's title over there, anyway? Senior sales rep. He's in charge of the used cars, and I take care of the new. That's more or less. In practice, we overlap. Along with Jake and Rudy, of course. He wants to keep reminding the kid of Jake and Rudy. No rich men's sons. They give a good day's work for their dollar. Are you satisfied with the job Charlie does for you? Absolutely. He knows the ropes better than I do. He knows half the county. Yeah, but his health. How much energy you think he has? The question has a certain collegiate tilt to it. He hasn't asked Nelson enough about college. Maybe that's the way through to him. All these women around, it's too easy for Nelson to hide. Energy? He has to watch himself and take it easy, but he gets the job done. People don't like to be hustled these days. There was too much of that, the way the car business used to be. I think a salesman who's a little, what's the word, laid back, people trust more. I don't mind Charlie's style. He wonders if Melanie does. Where are they in some restaurant? He pictures her face, bright-eyed almost like a thyroid bulge, and her cheeks that look always rouged, rosy with exertion, even before she bought the Fuji, her young face dense and smooth as she smiles and keeps smiling opposite old Charlie's classic con man's profile as he puts his move on her. And then later that business down below, his thick cock, that blue-brown of Mediterranean types, and he wonders if her hair there is as curly as the hair on her head, in and out. He can't believe it will happen, while the rest of them sit here listening to the rain. Nelson is saying, I was wondering if something couldn't be done with convertibles. A heavy, shamed diffidence thickens his words, so they seem to drop one by one from his face, downturned where he sits in the tired gray sofa with his muskrat cut. Convertibles how? You know, Dad, don't make me say it. Buy them and sell them. Detroit doesn't make them anymore, so the old ones are more and more valuable. You could get more than you paid for Mom's Maverick. If you don't wreck it first. This reminder has the effect Rabbit wants. Shit, the boy exclaims, defenseless, darting looks at every corner of the ceiling, looking for the escape hatch. I didn't wreck your damn precious corona. I just gave it a little dent. It's still in the shop. Some dent. I didn't do it on purpose. Christ, Dad, you act like it was some divine chariot or something. You've gotten so uptight in your old age. Have I? He asks sincerely, thinking this might be information. Yes, all you think about is money and things. That's not good, is it? No. You're right. Let's forget about the car. Tell me about college. 
It's yucky, is the prompt response. It's Dollsville. People think because of that shooting ten years ago, it's some great radical place. But the fact is most of the kids are Ohio locals whose idea of a terrific time is drinking beer till they throw up and having shaving cream fights in the dorms. Most of them are going to go into their father's business anyway. They don't care. Harry ignores this, asking, You ever have reason to go over to the big Firestone plant? I keep reading in the paper where they kept making those steel-belted radial 500s even after they kept blowing up on everybody. Typical, the boy tells him. All the products you buy are like that, all the American products. We used to be the best, Harry says, staring into the distance as if toward a ground where he and Nelson can perfectly agree. So I'm told. The boy looks downward into his book. Nelson, about work. I told your mother we'd make a summer job for you over there on wash-up and maintenance. You'd learn a lot just watching Manny and the boys. Dad, I'm too old for wash-up, and maybe I need more than a summer job. Are you trying to tell me you'd drop out of college with one lousy year to go? His voice has grown loud, and the boy looks alarmed. He stares at his father, open-mouthed, the dark ajar spot, making with his two eye sockets three holes in a hollow face. The rain drums on the porch roof spout. Janice and her mother come down from the Waltons, weeping. Janice wipes at her eyes with her fingers and laughs. It's so stupid to get carried away. It was in people how all the actors couldn't stand each other. That's what broke up the show. Well, they have lots of reruns, Ma Springer says, dropping onto the gray sofa beside Nelson, as if this little trip downstairs has been all her legs can bear. I'd seen that one before, but still they get to you. Harry announces, The kid here says he may not go back to Kent. Janice had been about to walk into the kitchen for a touch of Campari, but freezes standing. She is wearing just her short see-through nighty over underpants in the heat. You knew that, Harry, she says. Red bikini underpants, he notices, that show through as dusty pink. At the height of the heat wave last week, she got her hair cut in Brewer by a man Doris Kaufman goes to. He exposed the back of her neck and gave her bangs. Harry isn't used to them yet. It's as if a strange woman was slouching around here nearly naked. He almost shouts, The hell I did! After all the money we've put into his education? Well, Janice says, swinging so her body taps the nighty from within. Maybe he's got what he can out of it. I don't get all this. There's something fishy going on. The kid comes home with no explanation, and his girlfriend goes out with Charlie Stavros while he sits here hinting to me I should can Charlie so I can hire him instead. Well, Ma Springer pronounces peacefully, Nelson's of an age. Fred made space for you, Harry, and I know if he was here he'd make space for Nelson. In on the sideboard, dead Fred Springer listens to the rain misty-eyed. Not at the top, he wouldn't, Harry says. Not to somebody who quits college a few lousy credits short of graduating. Well, Harry, Ma Springer says, as calm and mellow as if the TV show had been a pipe of pot, some would have said you weren't so promising when Fred took you on. More than one person advised him against it. Out in the country, under the ground, old Farmer Byer mourns his fleet of school buses rotting in the rain. I was a forty-year-old man who'd lost his job through no fault of his own. I sat and did linotype as long as there was linotype. You worked at your father's trade, Janice tells him, and that's what Nelson's asking to do. Sure, sure, Harry shouts, when he gets out of college, if that's what he wants. Though, frankly, I'd hoped he'd want more. But what is the rush? What did he come home for, anyway? If I'd ever been so lucky at his age to get to a state like Colorado, I'd sure as hell have stayed at least the summer. Sexier than she can know, Janice drags on a cigarette. Why don't you want your own son home? He's too big to be home. What's he running from? From the look on their faces, he may have hit on something. He doesn't know what. He's not sure he wants to know what. In the silence that answers him, he listens again to the downpour, an incessant presence at the edge of their lamplight domain, gentle, insistent, unstoppable, a million small missiles striking home and running in rivulets from the face of things. Skeeter, Jill, and the Kent State Four are out there somewhere, bone dry. 
Forget it, Nelson says, standing up. I don't want any job with this creep. What's he so hostile for, Harry beseeches the women. All I've said was I don't see why we should fire Charlie so the kid can peddle convertibles. In time, sure. In 1980, even. Take over, young America. Eat me up. But one thing at a time, Jesus. There's tons of time. Is there? Janice asks strangely. She does know something. All cunts know something. He turns to her directly. You. I think you'd be loyal to Charlie, at least. More than to my own son? I'll tell you this. I'll tell you all this. If Charlie goes, I go. He struggles to stand, but the barca lounger has a sticky grip. Hip, hip, hooray, Nelson says, yanking his denim jacket from the clothes tree inside the front door and shrugging it on. He looks humpbacked and mean, a rat going out to be drowned. Now he's going out to wreck the maverick. Harry struggles to his feet and stands, taller than them all. Ma Springer slaps her knees with open palms. Well, this discussion has ruined my mood. I'm going to heat up water for a cup of tea. The damp has put the devil in my joints. Janice says, Harry, say good night to Nelson nicely. He protests, he hasn't said good night nicely to me. I was down here trying to talk nicely to him about college, and it was like pulling teeth. What's everything such a secret for? I don't even know what he's majoring in now. First it was pre-med, but the chemistry was too hard. Then it was anthropology, but there was too much to memorize. Last I heard, he'd switched to social science, but it was too much bullshit. I'm majoring in geography, Nelson admits, nervous by the door, tense to scuttle. Geography? That's something they teach in the third grade. I never heard of a grown-up studying geography. Apparently it's a great specialty out there, Janice says. What do they do all day, color maps? Mom, I got to split. Where's your car keys? Look in my raincoat pocket. Harry can't stop getting after him. Now remember, the roads around here are slippery when wet, he says. If you get lost, just call up your geography professor. Charlie's taking Melanie out really bugs you, doesn't it, Nelson says to him. Not at all. What bugs me is why it doesn't bug you. I'm queer, Nelson tells him. Janice, what have I done to this kid to deserve this? She sighs. Oh, I expect you know. He is sick of these allusions to his tainted past. I took care of him, didn't I? While you were off screwing around, who was it put his breakfast cereal on the table and got him off to school? My daddy did, Nelson says in a bitter, mincing voice. Janice intervenes. Nellie, why don't you go now if you're going to go? Did you find the keys? The child dangles them. You're committing automotive suicide, Harry tells her. This kid is a car killer. It was just a fucking dent, Nelson cries to the ceiling, and he's going to make me suffer and suffer. The door slams, having admitted a sharp gust of the aroma of the rain. Now who else would like some tea, Ma Springer calls from the kitchen. They go in to her. Moving from the stuffy, over-furnished living room to the kitchen with its clean enameled surfaces provides a brighter perspective on the world. Harry, you shouldn't be so hard on the boy, his mother-in-law advises. He has a lot on his mind. Like what? he asks sharply. Oh, Ma says, still mellow, setting out plates of comfort, Walton style. The things young people do. Janice has on underpants beneath her nighty, but no bra, and in the bright light her nipples show inside the cloth with their own pink color, darker, more toward wine. She is saying, It's a hard age. They seem to have so many choices, and yet they don't. They've been taught by television all their lives to want this and that, and yet when they get to be twenty they find money isn't so easy to come by after all. They don't have the opportunities even we had. This doesn't sound like her. Who have you been talking to, Harry asks, scornfully. Janice is harder to put down than formerly. She tidies her bangs with a fiddling, raking motion of her fingers and answers, Some of the girls at the club, their children, have come home too and don't know what to do with themselves. It even has a name now, the back to the nest something. Syndrome, he says. He is being brought round. He and Pop and Mom, sometimes after Mim had been put to bed, would settle like this around the kitchen table with cereal or cocoa, if not tea. He feels safe enough to sound plaintive. If he'd just ask for help, he says, I'd try to give it. 
but he doesn't ask. He wants to take without asking. And isn't that just human nature, Ma Springer says in a spruced-up voice. The tea tastes to her satisfaction, and she adds, as if to conclude, There's a lot of sweetness in Nelson. I think he's just a little overwhelmed for now. Who isn't, Harry asks. In bed, perhaps it's the rain that sexes him up. He insists they make love, though at first Janice is reluctant. I would have taken a bath, she says, but she smells great, deep jungle smell of precious rotting mulch going down and down beneath the ferns. When he won't stop, crazy to lose his face in this essence, the cool, stern fury of it takes hold of her, and combatively she comes, thrusting her hips up to grind her clitoris against his face, and then letting him finish inside her beneath him. Lying spent and adrift, he listens again to the rain's sound, which now and then quickens to a metallic rhythm on the window glass, quicker than the throbbing in the iron gutter, where ropes of water twist. I like having Nelson in the house, Harry says to his wife. It's great to have an enemy. Sharpens your senses. Murmurously beyond their windows, yet so close they might be in the cloud of it, the beach accepts, leaf upon leaf, shelves and stairs of continuous dripping, the rain. Nelson's not your enemy. He's your boy and needs you more now than ever, though he can't say it. Rain, the last proof left to him that God exists. I feel, he says, there's something I don't know. Janice admits, there is. What is it? Receiving no answer, he asks then, How do you know it? Mother and Melanie talk. How bad is it, drugs? Oh, Harry, no. She has to hug him. His ignorance must make him seem so vulnerable. Nothing like that. Nelson's like you are underneath. He likes to keep himself pure. Then what the fuck's up? Why can't I be told? She hugs him again and lightly laughs. Because you're not a springer. Long after she has fallen into the steady, soft rasping of sleep, he lies awake listening to the rain, not willing to let it go, this sound of life. You don't have to be a springer to have secrets. Blue eyes so pale in the light coming into the back seat of that Corolla. Janice's taste is still on his lips, and he thinks maybe it wouldn't be such a good idea for seal test. Twice, as he lies awake, a car stops outside and the front door opens. The first time, from the quietness of the motor and the lightness of the steps on the porch boards, Stavros dropping off Melanie. The next time, not many minutes later, the motor brutally raced before cutoff and the footsteps loud and defiant. Must be Nelson, having had more beers than was good for him. From the acoustical quality surrounding the sounds of this second car, Rabbit gathers that the rain is letting up. He listens for the young footsteps to come upstairs, but one set seems to trap the other in the kitchen, Melanie having a snack. The thing about vegetarians, they seem always hungry. You eat and eat, and it's never the right food. Who told him that once? Tothero. He seemed so old there at the end, but how much older than Harry is now, was he? Nelson and Melanie stay in the kitchen, talking until the eavesdropper wearies and surrenders. In his dream, Harry is screaming at the boy over the telephone at the lot. But though his mouth is open so wide, he can see all his own teeth spread open, like in those dental charts they marked your cavities on that looked like a scream, no sound comes out. His jaws and eyes feel frozen open, and when he awakes, it seems it has been the morning sun, pouring in violently after the rain, that he has been aping. The display windows at Springer Motors have been recently washed, and Harry stands staring through them with not a fleck of dust to show him he is not standing outdoors, in an air-conditioned outdoors, the world left rinsed and puddled by last night's rain, with yet a touch of weariness in the green of the tree across Route 111 behind the chuck wagon, a dead or yellow leaf here and there, at the tips of the crowded branches that are dying. The traffic this weekday flourishes. Carter keeps talking about a windfall tax on the oil company's enormous profits, but that won't happen, Harry feels. 
Carter is smart as a whip and prays a great deal, but his gift seems to be the old Eisenhower one of keeping much from happening, just a little daily seepage. Charlie is with a young black couple wrapping up the sale of a trade-in, unloading a 73 Buick eight-cylinder two-tone for 3K on good folks too far behind in the rat race to know times have changed, were running out of gas. The smart money is into foreign imports with sewing machine motors. They even got dressed up for the occasion. The wife wears a lavender suit with the skirt old-fashionedly short, her calves hard and high up on her skinny bow legs. They really aren't shaped like we are. Skeeter used to say they were the latest design. Her ass is high and hard along the same lines as her calves as she revolves gleefully around the garish old Buick in the drench of sunshine on the asphalt still wet and gleaming. A pretty sight out of the past. Still, it does not dispel the sour unease in Harry's stomach after his short night's sleep. Charlie says something that doubles them both up laughing, and then they drive the clunker off. Charlie comes back to his desk in a corner of the cool showroom, and Harry approaches him there. How'd you dig Melanie last night? He tries to keep the smirk out of his voice. Nice girl. Charlie keeps his pencil moving. Very straight. Harry's voice rises indignantly. What's straight about her? She's kooky as a bluebird for all I can see. Not so, champ. Very level head. She's one of those women you worry about. That they see it all so clearly they'll never let themselves go. You're telling me she didn't let herself go with you. I didn't expect her to. At my age, who needs it? You're younger than I am. Not at heart. You're still learning. It is as when he was a boy in grade school, and there seemed to be a secret everywhere, flickering up and down the aisles, bouncing around like the playground ball at recess. And he could not get his hands on it. The girls were keeping it from him. They were too quick. She mentioned Nelson? A fair amount. What you think is going on between them? I think they're just buddies. You don't think any more they got to be fucking? Charlie gives up, slapping his desk and pushing back from his paperwork. Hell, I don't even know how these kids have it organized. In our day, if you weren't fucking, you'd move on. With them, it may be different. They don't want to be killers like we were. If they are fucking, from the way she talks about them, it has about the charge of cuddling a one-eyed teddy bear before you go to sleep. She sees him that way, huh? Childish. Vulnerable is the way she'd put it. Harry offers... There's some piece missing here. Janice was dropping hints last night. Stavros delicately shrugs. Maybe it's back in Colorado, the piece. Did she say anything specific? Stavros ponders before answering, pushing up his amber glasses with a forefinger and then resting that finger on the bridge of his nose. No. Harry tries outright grievance. I can't figure out what the kid wants. He wants to get started at the real world. I think he wants in around here. I know he wants in, but I don't want him in. He makes me uncomfortable. With that sore head look of his, he couldn't sell Coke in the Sahara, Charlie finishes for him. Be that as it may, he's Fred Springer's grandson. He's Engonaki. Yeah, both Janice and Bessie are pushing. You saw that the other night. They're driving me wild. We have a nice symmetrical arrangement here, and how many cars did we move in July? Stavros checks a sheet of paper under his elbow. Twenty-nine, would you believe? Thirteen used, sixteen new, including three of those Celica GTs for ten grand each. I didn't think it would go, not against all the little sports coming out of Detroit at half the price. Those nips, they know their market research. So to hell with Nelson. There's only one month left in the summer anyway. Why screw Jake and Rudy out of some commission just to accommodate a kid too spoiled to take a job in the shop? He wouldn't even have to dirty his hands. We could have put him in parts. Stavros says, You could put him on straight salary here on the floor. I'd take him under my wing. Charlie doesn't seem to realize he is the one to get pushed out. You try to defend somebody, and he undermines you while you're doing it. But Charlie sees the problem after all. 
he expresses it. Look, you're the son-in-law. You can't be touched. But me, the old lady, is my connection here. And it's sentimental at that. She likes me because I remind her of Fred, of the old days. Sentiment doesn't beat out blood. I'm in no position to hang tough. If you can't beat him, join him. Furthermore, I think I can talk to the kid, do something for him. Don't worry. He'll never stick in this business. He's too twitchy. He's too much like his old man. I see no resemblance, Harry says, though pleased. You wouldn't. I don't know. It seems to be hard these days, being a father. When I was a kid, it seemed simple. Tell the kid what to do, and if he doesn't do it, sock him. Here's my thought. When you and Jan and the old lady are taking your weeks in the Poconos, has Nelson been planning to come along? They've asked him, but he didn't seem too enthusiastic. As a kid, he was always lonely up there. Jesus, it'd be hell in that little space. Even around the house, every time you come into a room, it seems he's sitting there with a beer. Right. Well, how about buying him a suit and tie and letting him come in here? Give him the minimum wage, no commission, and no draw. He wouldn't be getting on your nerves or you on his. How could I be getting on his nerves? He walks all over me. He takes the car all the time and tries to make me feel guilty besides. Charlie doesn't dignify this with an answer. He knows too much of the story. Harry admits, Well, it's an idea. Then he'd be going back to college? Charlie shrugs. Let's hope. Maybe you can make that part of the bargain. Looking down upon the top of Charlie's fragile striped skull, Rabbit cannot avoid awareness of his own belly, an extensive suit-straining slope. He has become a person and a half, where the same years have paired Charlie's shape, once stocky, bit by bit. He asks him, You really want to do this for Nelson? I like the kid. To me, he's just another basket case. At his age now, they're all basket cases. A couple has parked out in the glare and is heading for the showroom doors, a well-dressed pen park sort of pair that will probably collect the literature and sneak off to buy a Mercedes as an investment. Well, it's your funeral, Harry tells Charlie. Actually, it might be nice all around. Melanie wouldn't be left alone in that big house all by herself. And it occurs to him that this all may be Melanie's idea and Charlie's way of keeping his move on her alive. In bed, Melanie asks Nelson, What are you learning? Oh, stuff. They have decided upon her bed in the front room for these weeks when the old people are in the Poconos. Melanie, in the month and more of her tenancy here, has gradually moved the headless dress dummy to a corner and hidden some of the Springer's other ugly possessions, slid some rolled-up hall carpeting beneath the bed, tucked a trunk full of old curtains and a broken foot-pedaled singer into the back of the closet, already crammed with outgrown and outmoded clothes in polyethylene cleaner bags. She has scotch-taped a few Peter Max posters to the walls and made the room her own. They have used Nelson's room up to now, but his childhood bed is single and in truth he feels inhibited there. They had not intended to sleep together at all in this house, but out of their long and necessary conversations, it had been inevitable they sink into it. Melanie's breasts are indeed, as Charlie had noticed at a glance, large. Their laden, warm sway sometimes sickens Nelson, reminding him of a more shallow-breasted other, abandoned. He elaborates. Lots of things. There's all these pressures that don't show, like between the agency and the manufacturer. You got to buy sets of their special tools for thousands of dollars, and they keep loading their base models with what used to be extras, where the dealer used to make a lot of his profit. Charlie told me a radio used to cost the dealer about $35, and he'd add about 180 on to the sales price. See, then by the manufacturer getting greedy and taking these options away from the dealer, the dealers have to think up more gimmicks, like undercoating and rust-proofing. There's even a treatment they'll give the vinyl upholstery to keep it from wearing, supposedly. All that stuff. 
It's all cutthroat, but kind of jolly at the same time, all these little pep talks people keep giving each other. My grandfather used to have a performance board, but Dad's let it drop. You can tell Charlie thinks Dad's really lazy and sloppy. She pushes herself more upright in the bed, her breasts sluggish and silver in the half-light the maples filter from the sodium lamps on Joseph Street. There is that something heavy and maternal and mystical in her he cannot escape. Charlie's asked me out on another date, she says. Go, Nelson advises, enjoying the altered feeling of the bed, Melanie's lifting her torso above him, deepening the rumpled trough in which he lies. When he was a little child and Mom and Dad were living in that apartment high on Wilbur Street, and they would come visit here, he would be put to bed in this very room, his grandmother's hair all black then, but the patterns of light carved on the ceiling by the window mullions just the same as they are now. Mom, Mom would sing him songs, he remembers, but he can't remember what they were. In Pennsylvania Dutch, some of them, Ride, ride geil. Melanie pulls a hairpin from the back of her head and fishes with it in the ashtray for a dead roach that may have a hit or two left in it. She holds it to her red lips and lights it. The paper flares. When she lifted her arm to pull the hairpin, the hair in her armpit, unshaved, has flared in Nelson's field of vision. Despite himself, to no purpose, his prick with little knocks of blood begins to harden down in the trough of childish warmth. I don't know, Melanie says. I think with them anyway, he's psyched to score. How do you feel about that? Not so great. He's a pretty nice guy, Nelson says, snuggling deeper beside her abstracted body, enjoying the furtive growth of his erection. Even if he did screw Mom. Suppose it kills him. How would I feel then? I mean, one of the reasons for my coming with you was to clean my head of all this father figure shit. You came along because Prue told you to. Saying the other's name is delicious, a cool stab in the warmth. So I wouldn't get away. Well, yeah, but I wouldn't have if I hadn't had reasons of my own. I'm glad I came. I like it here. It's like America used to be. All these brick houses built so solid, one against the other. I hate it. Everything's so humid and stuffy and so closed. You really feel that, Nelson? He likes it when she kind of purrs his name. I thought you acted frightened in Colorado. There was too much space. Or maybe it was the situation. Nelson loses Colorado in awareness of his erection, like a piece of round-ended ridged ivory down there, and of the womanly thick cords in her throat swelling as she sucks one last hit from the tiny butt held tight against her painted lips. Melanie always wears makeup, lipstick, and touches of red to her cheeks to make her complexion less olive, where Prue never wore any, her lips pale as her brow, and everything about her face precise and dry as a photograph. Prue. The thought of her is a gnawing in his stomach, like somebody rolling a marble around over grits of sand. He says, Maybe what I mind about around here is Dad. At the thought of Dad, the abrasion intensifies. I can't stand him the way he sits there in the living room hogging the barca lounger. He, he can hardly find words. The discomfort is so great just sits there in the middle of the whole fucking world, taking and taking. He doesn't know anything the way Charlie does. What did he ever do to build up the lot? My granddad was grubbing his way up while my father wasn't doing anything but being a lousy husband to my mother. That's all he's done to deserve all this money, be too lazy and shiftless to leave my mother like he wanted to. I think he's queer. You should have seen him with this black guy I told you about. You loved your granddad, didn't you, Nelson? When she's high on pot, her voice gets husky and kind of trancy, like one of these oracles sitting over her tripod they talked about in Anthro at Kent. Kent, more sand rubbing in his stomach. He liked me, Nelson insists, writhing a little and noticing with his hand that his erection has slightly wilted, possessing no longer the purity of ivory, 
but the compromised texture of flesh and blood. He wasn't always criticizing me because I wasn't some great shakes athlete and ten feet tall. I've never heard your father criticize you, she says, except when you cracked up his car. God damn it, I didn't crack it up. I just dented the bastard, and he's going through this whole big deal, weeks in the body shop while I'm supposed to feel guilty or inept or something. And there was an animal in the road, some little thing. I don't know what it was, a woodchuck. I would have seen the stripes if it had been a skunk. I don't know why they don't make these dumb animals with longer legs. It waddled right into the headlights. I wish I'd killed it. I wish I'd smashed up all Dad's cars, the whole fucking inventory. This is really crazy talk, Nelson, Melanie says from within her amiable trance. You need your father. We all need fathers. At least yours is where you can find him. He's not a bad man. He is bad, really bad. He doesn't know what's up, and he doesn't care, and he thinks he's so great. That's what gets me, his happiness. He is so fucking happy. Nelson almost sobs. You think of all the misery he's caused, my little sister dead because of him, and then this Jill he let die. Melanie knows these stories. She says in a patient sing-song, You mustn't forget the circumstances. Your father's not God. Her hand follows down inside the bedsheet where his has been exploring. She smiles. Her teeth are perfect. She's had orthodonture, and poor Prue never did. Her people were too poor. So she hates to smile, though the irregularity isn't really that noticeable. Just a dog tooth slightly overlapping on one side. You're feeling frustrated right now, Melanie tells him, because of your situation. But your situation is not your father's fault. It is, Nelson insists. Everything's his fault. It's his fault I'm so fucked up, and he enjoys it. The way he looks at me sometimes, you can tell he's really eating it up that I'm fucked up. And then the way Mom waits on him, like he's actually done something for her instead of the other way around. Come on, Nelson, let it go, Melanie croons. Forget everything for now. I'll help you. She flips down the sheet and turns her back. Here's my ass. I love being fucked from behind when I have a buzz on. It's like I'm occupying two planes of being. Melanie hardly ever tries to come when they make love, takes it for granted she is serving the baby male and not herself. With Prue, though, the woman was always trying, breathing weight in his ear, and squirming around with her pelvis for the right contact. And even when he couldn't wait and failed, this was somehow more flattering. Remembering Prue this way, he feels the nibble of guilt in the depths of his stomach take a sharper bite, like the moment in Jaws when the girl gets pulled under. Water. Rabbit distrusts the element, though the little brown hourglass-shaped lake that laps the gritty beach in front of the Springer's old cottage in the Poconos seems friendly and tame, and he swims in it every day, taking a dip before breakfast, before Janice is awake, and while Ma Springer, in her quilty bathrobe, fusses at the old oil stove to make the morning coffee. On weekdays, when there aren't so many people around, he walks down across the coarse imported sand, wrapped in a beach towel, and, after a glance right and left at the cottages that flank theirs back in the pines, he slips into the lake naked. What luxury! A chill silver embrace down and through his groin. Gnats circling near the surface shatter and reassemble as he splashes through them, cleaving the plane of liquid stillness, sending ripples right and left toward muddy, rooty banks city blocks away. A film of mist sits visible on the skin of the lake if the hour is early enough. He was never an early-to-rise freak, but sees the point of it now. You get into the day at the start, before it gets rolling, and roll with it. The film of mist tastes of evening chill, of unpolluted freshness in a world waking with him. As a kid, Rabbit never went to summer camps. Maybe Nelson is right. They were too poor. It never occurred to them. The hot, cracked sidewalks and dusty playground of Mount Judge were summer enough. And the few trips to the Jersey Shore his parents organized stick up in his remembrance as almost torture. 
the hours on pokey roads in the old Model A, and then the mud-brown Chevy, his sister and mother adding to the heat the vapors of female exasperation, pop, dogged at the wheel, the back of his neck sweaty and scrawny and freckled, while the flat little towns of New Jersey threw back at Harry distorted echoes of his own town, his own life, for which he was homesick after an hour. Town after town numbingly demonstrated to him that his life was a paltry thing, roughly duplicated by the millions in settings where houses and porches and trees, mocking those in Mount Judge, fed the illusions of other little boys, that their souls were central and dramatic and invisibly cherished. He would look at the little girls on the sidewalks they drove alongside, wondering which of them he would marry. For his idea of destiny was to move away and marry a girl from another town. The traffic, as they neared the shore, became thicker, savage, metropolitan. Cars, he has always found cars, their glitter, their exhalations, cruel. Then at last, arriving in a burst of indignities, the parking lot full, the bathhouse attendant rude, they would enter upon a few stilted hours on the alien beach, whose dry sand burned the feet and scratched in the crotch, and whose wet ribs where the sea had receded had a deadly bottomless smell, a smell of vast death. Every found shell had this frightening faint stink. His parents in bathing suits alarmed him. His mother didn't look obscenely fat like some of the other mothers, but bony and long and hard. And as she stood to call him, or little Mim, back from the suspect crowds of strangers, or the dangerous rumor of undertow, her arms seemed to be flapping like featherless wings. Not rabbit, then. He would be called as Hassy, Hassy and his father's skin, where the work clothes always covered it, seemed so tenderly white. He loved his father for having such whiteness upon him, secretly, a kind of treasure. In the bathhouse he and Pop changed together rapidly, not looking at one another, and at the end of the day changed again. The ride back to Diamond County was always long enough for the sunburn to start hurting. He and Mim would start slapping each other just to hear the other yell, and to relieve the boredom of this wasted day that could have been spent among the fertile intrigues and perfected connections of the Mount Judge playground. In his memory of these outings, they always seemed to be climbing toward the ocean as toward a huge blue mountain. Sometimes at night before falling to sleep, he hears his mother say with a hiss, Hassy. He sees, now that he is rich, that these were the outings of the poor, ending in sunburn and stomach upset. Pop liked crab cakes and baked oysters, but could never eat them without throwing up. When the Model A was tucked into the garage and little Mim tucked into bed, Harry could hear his father vomiting in a far corner of the yard. He never complained about vomiting or about work. They were just things you had to do, one more regularly than the other. So as a stranger to summer places, Rabbit had come to this cottage Fred Springer had bought rather late in his life, after the Toyota franchise had made him more than a used car dealer, after his one child was married and grown. Harry and Janice used to come for just visits of a week. The space was too small, the tensions would begin to rub through, with Nelson bored and bug-eaten after the first day or so. 